It will be a Sydney-Brisbane grand final after one of the most remarkable prelims in living memory. Riley Beveridge and Kane Corns with you on the round so far, brought to you by Amy and Kane. What did we just witness? Brisbane through to the granny. I'm still not sure. It's one of the best games you've ever seen. Uh, one of the best finals you will ever see. That's the final siren. That That is the joy, the relief after Brisbane come from behind. They look shot throughout the second quarter where the Geelong side kicked seven goals and you thought this is a, all going one way. And it was mm. all, all going Geelong's way. But after half time, I thought Brisbane completely dominated this game of footy and there were some huge moments in the last quarter. There certainly were. How do you put this into words? Because Geelong looked like they were going to win it when Ollie Henry kicked a late goal. Brisbane snatched it back. Just the last five minutes were as tense as I can remember. That one from Camera to Archie. I mean, what about his final series? Last week, I called him the most underpaid player in the game. Well, he delivered again. McKenna came on as a sub for McInerney, who will get to. How smart is that to Morris? You think, here come Brisbane. But then this man, he kicked four. Mm. Oh, I think Payne's a real issue for Brisbane. I don't, he's clearly not fit. He was poor last week. Had five kicked on him. He had four kicked on him. There's Rayner. What about his game <laughs> after a quiet one last week and one of the best tackles you'll ever see in a prelim final Tom Stewart look at the score there look at that moment and Geelong go down and that man Henry kicks another snap goal to put them left. in front with two minutes 40 to go contest from Cameron brilliant and that man Archie who just cannot miss at the moment uh, Brisbane clutch after they squandered some opportunities and yeah. then Rayner again on the left from outside 50. That one clears the line on the non-preferred. He had 18, he kicked two after a quiet first half. He needed to lift. He was poor last week. He didn't doubt himself. And that tackle there saves the game for Brisbane, even though Reese Stanley had a shot yeah. late and he was sore and he was injured and he hit the post. And Brisbane survived. What an amazing season from them. So many times they looked <laughs> shot. They looked shot last week. They looked shot at halftime tonight. Yeah. And they are through to a grand final. Amazing story. They were done 25 points down in the third quarter, early in the third quarter. And they were kicking and marking, kicking and marking, but they couldn't get going any, anything going forward to centre. Then that just introduced a bit of chaos ball and yeah. it worked. Chris Fagan's been criticised this year for, I mean, a lack of technical nous, I guess, and that's been the narrative. But uh, he destroyed Chris Scott um, from, well, the, the Lions coaching collective destroyed mm. Geelong from their coach's box. 111 marks they took and the amount of times that they went back through the corridor. So Geelong were just unable to shut down Brisbane's ball movement. Now, they knew what was coming. Keep Brisbane to under 100 marks, you basically win, but they couldn't do that. So some of the numbers are plus 72 in disposals. They smashed them from clearance, even yeah. though Oscar McInerney went off. Plus 60 for uncontested possessions and plus 47 for marks in the wet. Mm. So I don't know what Chris Scott was doing. Like, any chance you could shut Brisbane's ball movement down, shut down the corridor, and own that uh, after half time Brisbane dominated this game of footy. Ryan Lester was fantastic. He's been an unsung hero for so long at the Lions. He's also one of their longest tenured players now going into this week's grand final. His job on Jeremy Cameron was great. 20 disposals, 9 intercepts. Yeah, well, this was another win for Chris Fagan. He's going, oh, who's going to play on Jeremy Cameron? Mm. I, I thought maybe Stasevich was the matchup. Payne was clearly beaten and inhibited by that knee injury, and he was beaten badly by Hogan. Harris Andrews, not the right matchup, but Chris Fagan said, now Lester's got a good record on him, and he was excellent. Now, Jeremy kicked a couple of goals. I thought a couple of those were fortunate. Yeah. First one sort of fell into his lap, right foot snap, and then the second one also a mistimed spoil fell into his hands and he kicked two clever goals. But not only did Leicester shut him down, but his influence on the game, 20 disposals, five mark, nine mm. intersteps, and only the fourth time this year he's had 20-plus disposal. He was just one of those unsung preliminary final heroes. One of the big stories this week is going to revolve around Oscar McInerney. The Lions Ruckman subbed off after a double dislocated shoulder. He did it twice throughout the course of the game. Chris Fagan speaking afterwards said, if you, dis if you double dislocate your shoulder in a preliminary final, you're not going to play in the grand final. So it leaves them with a decision now. Do they go with Darcy Fort, who's played two games all year, hasn't played since April 25? Do they go with the youngster, Henry Smith, who played the last four games of the home and away season? Or do they go with Joe Danaher in the ruck again and go small? Not sure. We're just seeing him dislocated again there. So I don't know. Only Brisbane will know because of the two players you mentioned haven't played for such a long period yeah. of time. So we will only know how they've been training, how competitive they've been against each other. This will be one of those heroic prelim final stories because they were smashing, he was smashing Stanley mm. in the ruck and Brisbane dominant.
dominant from stoppage in the first quarter. He goes off, was able to come back on, which I think just allowed Joe Danaher not to have to ruck for three quarters. Yeah. So he came back on, did his best, dislocated again, and then Joe went in there and he was enormous. So I don't know which way they'll go. They actually mm. looked pretty good when Joe Danaher was in the ruck, but I doubt they'll want him to ruck for four quarters against Brodie Grundy next week. You mentioned that Geelong couldn't stop Brisbane's run. Geelong at times couldn't generate their own run, and that was down to Max Holmes going off halfway through the third quarter with another hamstring injury. It looked like he was going to be the big story. Of course, missed the 2022 flag with a hamstring in the prelim. He was their leading ball winner. He had 20 disposals early in the third quarter when he was taken off. Another incident that changed the game. Yeah, and I think he's their most important player. And he comes back on here and tries to give it one last go. Had one possession and then went, ran straight back to the interchange yeah. bench, shakes his head there and says, nah, can't go again. So he wouldn't have played in the grand final again if mm. they had got through. So heartbreak probably highlights why they're so keen on Bailey Smith. There's definitely a lack of leg speed through that midfield. And we saw that Brisbane were just running away from them and their ball use. Geelong just were out on their feet despite having the week off. So they need to inject some youth and, to, and some speed into that uh, midfield because they're too reliant on homes. Brisbane through to a grand final. They will play Sydney, who won on Friday night in the first prelim against Port Adelaide. They were just clinical forward of centre. We've said this so often this season. They just spotted up targets on the lead all night. Yeah, they did. So this is what we're highlighting here. I mean, just great ball use. I thought the forwards are really disciplined, just the hold and their timing of the lead. This one, I think, Parker on Alia. Parker went over to Alia after he started so well. And Alia still took seven intercept marks. Thought he was Port Adelaide's best player. But the constant movement and the selflessness of the other Sydney forwards to identify the mismatch, and we'll see that with Heaney shortly, and just get out of the way. So it, clearly this is the mismatch for Heaney here. Oh, this is the lead up here where the free kick against Bergman to Amadi. We'll see the Heaney one in a moment. But the discipline for the forward just to hold and wait for the kicker, identify the space and for everyone else to get out of the way. I mean, this, this was just terrific. And I mean, Port Adelaide, their defenders looked like they had cement in their boots. Like Zert Thatcher there, he, he looks like he's just running in quicksand. Oh, that's how poor he was after such a great game against Hawthorne last week. So they'd be really disappointed with their inability to shut uh, mm. Sydney's ball use down. They went wide. Port Adelaide yep. focused to, through the corridor, but Sydney were disciplined just to take what Port Adelaide gave them, and you saw the results. And then in contrast, Port Adelaide couldn't get anything going forward of centre on its own. So, Salva Radaglia has three disposals, one mark, no goals. Charlie Dixon has two disposals, no marks and no goals to half-time. This is where the game got away from them. Five goals down at half-time, they couldn't come back. Yeah, predictable ball use. You see, you saw that time and time again, that long bomb inside forward 50. And, and people say, why is Radicalia playing forward? Why, why is Dixon playing? I'll say to you, who else do you want to pick? Mm. There's, like, there's no one else. Finlayson is out for the year. Todd Marshall is concussed and question marks over his future. Ollie Lord can't touch the footy in the sample, so you're not going to play him. So unless you go really small and put... Francis Evans or Jed McIntyre or someone there, then this is what you're going to have to get. So the issue with Port Adelaide is not that these two players were selected, is there was no one else to select yeah. for them when there's some injuries. So the lack of depth on their list is the biggest concern for Port Adelaide this off-season. Not sure how they address it with the... They don't have a lot of draft picks, do they? So... They're going to have to get pretty creative to, to try and come up with a more efficient forward line that, that's going to work. Maybe a Jack Lacocious or a Joe Richards for Port Adelaide in the future. Port Adelaide won their last eight games against Sydney and they've done it through winning the ball. Disposals, contested possessions, marks, getting it forward inside 50. But on Friday night, the Swans flipped the script and just completely dominated in all of the areas where, where Port Adelaide have been so strong. Yeah, I mean, Port Adelaide's still um, pretty good in inside 50s, plus yeah. five there. Um, the, the contested stuff and their effort. Uh, Sydney dominated in, in marks inside forward 50 and disposals, so they just owned the ball. Yeah. And, and once they had that lead, I thought there was a real maturity about the way that they play. Clearly their best four-quarter performance for the year with mm. big stakes on the line. So their game's in really good order. Their list is in good health. they got good depth. They've got players that can be pretty versatile. I think the run that they get off the back from Florent and Blakey, I think the discipline of Cunningham and Lloyd and these types of players, they have a lot of those unheralded players that we don't speak about because they're overshadowed by the stars, but they're such an even side. It's, we've said this all year, but when Isaac Heaney and Chad Warner play well, Sydney play well, and they did again on Friday night. Heaney, 24 disposals, two goals. Warner, 21 disposals, two goals. Such difference makers for to see. Yeah, I know. He can't win the brown, though, but if there was a league MVP uh, that goes across the finals, this is your man. Like, mm. This is the hottest player in football right now, Isaac Heaney, and, and Warner does what Warner does. You can see not, not his biggest game, Warner, but what a weapon he is. Just to, and, and they all complement each other so well. Travis Boak had just an awful night kicking it straight back to Sydney, so that helps. He probably did that three or 
or four times, Travis, that led directly to goals, as did a number of Port Adelaide players that got really hurt off turnover. But Heaney's centre forward play and his confidence in the air and to take on any opponent right now, like he feels like he man. He yeah. feels absolutely invincible. So probably going to start favourite from the Norm Smith medal, I would have thought, Isaac, yeah. Smith, Isaac Heaney. Uh, Ken Hinckley now, fourth preliminary final loss while in charge of the power. He was asked about that after the game. This is what he had to say. You know, I'm not silly enough not to acknowledge that I have been the constant, you know, along with some other people at the footy club, but it's not of one person. Like, we, we should stop that story a little bit. It, this, is a, this is a whole of club thing that goes on. It's not one person responsible. If we had got through tonight, it wouldn't have been me. If, and, and if we didn't get through tonight, it wouldn't be... It'd be us. And I think that's the, the language we like to use at Port. It, it's about us, not, not me necessarily. But I do understand that as the head coach, you, you cop the brunt of that. It is clearly an issue now for Port Adelaide. It has been for, some, for a long time. What do they need to do to take that next step? Yeah, improve their list, mm. oh, I would say. Like, you, you're just going to see that you're not going to win a prelim final at Sydney away from home with Radagalia, with Dixon playing in the side, with Zerk Thatcher playing in the side, with Narkel playing in the side, with Francis Evans playing in the side. I can go on and on and on. Mm. Their list isn't good enough. Travis spoke at 36 years of age, probably going to have to hang up the boots. So there's 10 players out there that shouldn't be. This is the problem with Port Adelaide. So... Um, that's why their performance against Hawthorne, who are absolutely stacked, was so strong the previous week. Now, that doesn't absolve them from the previous years, but right now that's the reality for Port Adelaide is that your list is not good enough. And my belief is that, OK, hand the keys to Josh Carr, he's still going to have the same list. Now, that's not to say mm. there's going to come a point where this team doesn't need a fresh voice, and whether that's now or whether that's in 12 months' time, that will be up for the board and the footy club to make, but the biggest issue is the lack of talent and depth on the list, and that was exposed in big games this year against Geelong and against Sydney. We spoke about Oscar McInerney before. There's a couple of selection concerns for the Swans as well. Logan McDonald went off late in the game with a foot ankle injury. Uh, Callum Mills, obviously, is coming back from that hamstring problem, which kept him out. He, we touch and go. They've got the Taylor Adams against Robbie Fox situation. Which way do you reckon they think they, they play it? Oh, they'd be pretty, pretty comfortable with what they delivered, wouldn't they? With yeah. that uh, 23 that played on the weekend. So, I, I mean, unless McDonald doesn't get up or mm. unless there's an injury at training I couldn't see a world in which they change that side. Sydney and Brisbane playing off in a grand final for the first time since South Melbourne and Fitzroy did in 1899 but if you ever wondered how the ball gets there on grand final day take a look at this. Just make sure Katy Perry finishes with Raw. It's a banger now for the big one the delivery of the grand final match ball. Don't worry boss I've got this over the last couple of years we've seen a few clangers and if it wasn't for Amy and you guys in the room, the match ball would never have made it to the grand final. This year we're running a tight ship. It cannot happen again. And that's why, Dills, I've got my top man on the job. Don't worry, KB. I won't let you down. Lucky you're with Amy. Can't wait until next week's grand final. Well, this is it for us, Kane, on the round so far. Before we go, a couple of massive thank yous. Firstly, to Jason behind the camera, who's here each and every week. We love what we get from Jason every week. CD on audio. Peter in technical director. Uh, Aaron Pereira, Josh Moffat and Anthony Boetti, who do so much work clipping everything up and putting this show on behind the scenes. Ryan McLaughlin and Amy Rockman on graphics as well. And two guys who do a mountain of work behind the scenes that you never see, but they are crucial in terms of this show getting up. Lockie Rand, who's our director, and Paul Baston, who is our producer. They are the stars of this show. Also, thank you so much for your That's help fun. throughout the year, Kane. Who do you reckon wins it next week? I'm going to go with Sydney. And thanks for all your work this year. It's been enormous. Had a big year. Thank you. Good luck next week, Sydney and Brisbane fans. Want to get all the latest footy news in one hit? From injuries to breaking news, the latest from the coaches, the Footy Feed team has you covered. Watch it now on afl.com.au and the AFL Live app or wherever you get your podcasts.